Welcome everybody to another 30 minute webinar from Flight New Media. Today we're going to be focusing on SEO or search engine optimization. Basically how you can rank higher at the search engines and drive more qualified traffic to your website or blog. If you haven't been on one of these 30 minute webinars before, they are 30 minutes in length from beginning to end. Uh, although I do stick around afterwards to answer any questions you may have about SEO and your own website. In fact, uh, if you're interested, I'm even happy to show, take a look at your website. We can talk about it and see any SEO opportunities you may have. That'll happen at the end. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please go ahead and leave those questions in the questions tab. Uh, I probably will not be pausing I will probably just work my way through, but I'll be answering all those questions when our time is up. And with that, let's jump into this. Now, SEO is actually one of my favorite topics to discuss because after working in this business for 20 years and with hundreds and hundreds of clients, most of them small businesses and entrepreneurs, I've realized that the number one way that you are going to get new business is through search engines and content marketing. So we really, I think this is such a critical piece and I know that a lot of people love social media and they're always focused on social, but for a lot of small businesses, especially B2B, but really in any category, SEO is critical. Uh, the value of good SEO cannot be overstated. Depending on your business, it could generate tens of thousands of dollars in business this calendar year for your company or even more. So let's dive in. All right, hopefully you're seeing the second slide now. Uh, to give you a little context of how SEO fits in with the rest of your digital marketing, I want to share with you our framework. And our framework is called the Bare Essentials of Digital Marketing. And after working with all these companies over the years, uh, this is basically the framework that seems to simplify and break down what you need to do in digital marketing to succeed if you're a small business. BEAR is an acronym, the B stands for build, and we talk a lot about how to build a website that turns visitors into customers. A is for attract, or how do we drive that qualified traffic to your website? And we do that through primarily through SEO, social media, and digital ads. So we're gonna focus today a lot on the attract section of this, of this framework. R is for retain, or how do you stay in touch with people after they've left your website? And that's done often through email marketing, which we discussed in our previous webinar. Uh, also through uh, retargeting or remarketing, uh, which is another form of advertising for people who have come to our website and not taken a buy or not made a buying decision. And lastly, evaluate. How do we measure and analyze our results? And that's a critical piece that actually fav uh, figures heavily into SEO as well. Just very quickly, if you're tuning in, you don't know who I am. My name is Rich Brooks, and I'm the president of Flight New Media. We're a web design and internet marketing company located in beautiful Portland, Maine. Work with small businesses, and we're celebrating our 20th year in business this year. I'm also the founder of the Agents of Change, which is a weekly podcast and an annual conference. Uh, the podcast is free. You can find it on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and all those places you check out podcasts. Uh, and the event takes place every September. This year it'll be September 20th and 21st. We're adding a second day to our conference this year with a series of in-depth workshops. Tickets are not currently on sale, but they will be going on sale shortly. And uh, that's something you always want to check out. And if you can't make it to Portland, Maine, we also do a live feed and record everything on video for on-demand content. I'm also the tech guru on 207, where I do hard-hitting news stories, like how to take better pictures with your smartphone and where the best recipe sites are online. And lastly, last year, I wrote a book called Lead Machine, The Small Business Guide to Digital Marketing. And that's kind of a summary of what I've learned over the past 20 years in terms of how to market businesses and how to generate leads online. So let's talk about this search engine optimization piece. Uh, I like to say that there's three sections of SEO, and the first one is on page, or how the words on your web pages match up with the search that was just done at the search engines. Off page, often it's the uh, number and quality of incoming links to your site, and technical, and we'll take a look at some technical issues. So we're gonna look at on page, off page, and technical as three of the key components 
to improving your search engine ranking, improving your visibility, and driving more qualified leads to your website. So we'll start with some on-page stuff. First of all, it's important to know that for years, SEO was narrowly focused on keywords. What keywords are my customers using at Google? Where should I put my keywords? Uh, how often should I use my keywords on the page? What keywords are people using to find me? Then suddenly, Google gets all tight-lipped about the, about the subject and about keywords. They tell us that we should be focusing instead on providing value for our customers, not focusing on keywords. And then they start hiding data on us, like putting cookies on the top shelf. Uh, in fact, if you look at this uh, screen capture right here, this is from our Agents of Change website. And the keywords that drove traffic to the website, uh, the number one result was not provided, and the number three result was not set. So between these two, about 97% of my traffic that came from Google, Google won't share with me what keywords they used to find us, which is kind of frustrating. But I am here to tell you that despite all this, and despite a lot of SEO gurus saying that keywords don't matter anymore, they absolutely matter. They're, it, they're still critical because it's important as marketers, as business people, that we need to understand and know and use the words and phrases that our best prospects are using so that we can use them as well. Search engines are getting smarter, no doubt about it. They're getting better at semantic search, which is basically about understanding the intent of what searchers are looking for. But using the words that our customers use on our web page is always going to be critical. So it's important that we know what they are. So how do we do that? Well, we start with something that is often referred to as keyword research. So there's a few elements of keyword research. First of all, there's the brainstorming phase, and we'll go into each one of these. Secondly, then we need to test some of the results that we got. And finally, we need to create content based on what we're seeing out there. So when it comes to the brainstorming session, what I usually recommend to businesses and to people are there's five perspectives that I like to use in any sort of keyword brainstorming session. The first one is the most obvious. What are the products or services that you bring to market? So, you know, a lot of times people might be um, a, a barber or a doctor or they manufacture conveyor belts, whatever it is, like put that in. And, and especially if you're in a situation where your location matters. So you're a Denver dentist or you're a uh, Boston pediatrician, whatever it is, like those, those are very important because think about it from how your customers are going to be searching for you. So often these are very competitive terms. There's a lot of people who might want to rank well for them, but these are important because they describe what you do or what your products and services are. So what I recommend is, is brainstorm as many phrases as you possibly can around your products and services. Next, move on to what are the real or perceived problems that your customers suffer from. So what are your ideal customers struggling with or the customers that you've worked with when they came to you? What were their biggest problems? Because a lot of times when we go to the search engines, we search on what our problems are, what we're trying to overcome. So maybe it's hair loss, maybe it's rowdy teenagers, maybe it's crabgrass, whatever it is for your business, figure out what the real problems are that your customers are struggling with that they're likely to go to Google and ask Google for help. Next, just flip that on its head. What are the real or perceived benefits or solutions that your product offers? So just like some people search on problems, other people search on solutions. So maybe they're searching for hair restoration, or maybe they're searching for healthy organic lawns, or maybe they're searching for, uh, trying to think of what, the, oh, so teen, teenagers, rowdy teenagers, maybe, you know, they're thinking of, uh, uh, happy teenagers that's or or European boarding schools you know whatever it is that's going to take care of the problem so think about some of the solutions that you offer that they're looking for fourth category is features so if you've ever taken a sales course you know you never sell on features you always sell on benefits but on the internet that's not necessarily true because very often our best prospects have done so much research that they may know more about what we have to offer than we do ourselves. So if somebody is searching for features, it means that they've already done their homework, which means that they're much closer to making a buying decision, and we want to be in front of people who are ready to make a buying decision. And lastly, 
we want to take a look at our competition. And when I say competition, I don't mean that uh, if you own a burger joint that you start throwing around words like McDonald's or Burger King. And I don't mean that if you're a uh, dentist in a big practice, you start using the names of other dentists that you're competing with. I just don't think that's going to be very beneficial. Instead, what I mean is if you are bringing a product or service to market to solve a problem, chances are there are other ways to solve that problem for your ideal customers. If you run a gym, a lot of people might join the gym to lose weight, but a gym is not the only way to lose weight. They may be, uh, they might choose to lose weight through diet pills or through a fad diet or with the thigh master. So then you need to come up with these and put them into your brainstorming session so that down the road you can create blog posts about uh, why a gym membership is a healthy alternative to a diet pill or why that new fad diet won't get you into your wedding dress in time for your wedding or why the thigh master actually makes your butt look bigger. So whatever it is, you're going to probably end up creating content around some of the other solutions people might find so that you can get in front of them and explain why your solution is better than what they were originally looking for. The sound cut out. Back, I assume that it's back on. Can I just get an amen here? Yes, back on. All right. Maybe that was just a dramatic pause. I don't know. Uh, I'm recording everything on my end, so if there was a long pause, we'll uh, we'll have it all available in the in in the recording. All right. So the next step after you've done all this brainstorming, um, you may be totally off base. And this is the curse of knowledge that you may know more or may have forgotten more about your own business than other people know. So we need to test it. And there's a number of ways that we can test all these keywords that we generated. One of the best ones and it's free, is the Google AdWords Keyword Planner. Now, it is free. You do need to sign up for an account at Google AdWords. That's free. I've also discovered that Google uh, or Keyword Planner gives you much better information if you spend any money with Google AdWords. So I might recommend at least running a couple ads even just for a week or so, because once you do that, Google starts giving you much more detailed information. So spending a few bucks is well worth it to unlock these better results. So in this case, I take one of my keyword phrases or a few of them, healthcare cost, health insurance cost, health insurance rate, so on and so forth. I plug those into this tool and then I hit search. And this is what Google brings back to me. They tell me about those three keyword phrases, but they also tell me that, they also tell me some other related terms as well. So we can see here, health insurance cost, average monthly search is 5,400, the competition, which is actually not competition for organic search, but competition for paid search, but a lot of times there's overlap there, uh, is medium. Healthcare costs, 5,400 also, low. Health insurance rates, 1,300, competition is high. And then as I look down below, I can see some other related terms that I might want to go after as well. People are, a lot of people are searching for health insurance, in fact, 368,000 a month. Medical insurance, 74,000 a month. Health insurance plan, so on and so forth. So these are other content areas that I I might want to create content for either for a web page or for a blog post. Now, obviously, these have to be relevant to your business. Just because they have a high count doesn't mean that they're actually going to be good for you. You want to be writing content in areas that you can actually help people with. But this starts to give you a good idea of the words and phrases that people are using at the search engine so you can better create your copy. Often what I'll do, uh, and actually I think this slides out of order because I would have organized some of my keywords into different groups before I actually went over to Keyword Planner to put them in and that's why I had some related terms there together. Another tool that I like to use is another free tool called Google Trends. And this is especially good when I'm creating blog posts. Um, if you want to write a blog post and you're not exactly sure what phrase you should use, you can use Google Trends to do two big important tasks. One is to see how a word ranks or the search volume for a word over time. This is a search you can do over five over the past five years, but also compare different terms. So as you can see here, I've got DIY weddings, cheap weddings, and budget weddings. And 
to be honest, I never would have thought cheap weddings would have been the most popular term, but you can see that it's always the most popular term searched for. So if I was going to write a blog post about budget weddings, yeah, I probably still use the word budget weddings somewhere within it because people are searching for it. But my title tag and the word that I would really concentrate on or the phrase that I would concentrate on would be cheap weddings. So this is another great tool just to get a sense of what people are searching for. Further down the page, you can also see some rising and top search terms related to all of your search terms. So you can see here, for rustic weddings, we also see rustic weddings on a budget, best destination weddings on a budget, wedding budget breakdown, destination weddings. These could all be different blog posts or pages or other types of content that I'm going to create because I'm seeing that these are rising or, or kind of like emerging search trends and I want to be on top of them. So when I've got all this data, uh, what I want to do next is I want to sit down and create my content. I want to take my keywords and put them in the right places on my page. And I'm just going to show you some of the most important ones right now. Uh, the first one uh, is the title tag. So in this particular page, the keyword that they were targeting is infusion therapy services. So let's just take a closer look at this. You can see here that the page title is infusion therapy services, New England Life Care, which is the brand name. They could have done more with this, but the bottom line is they've got their keywords right at the front of this particular page, the title tag in this page, and that's very important too. Making sure that your keywords appear at the beginning of the title tag is always most important. If there was another phrase that was related to infusion therapy services, maybe they could have worked that in as well to the title, but there's always room for improvement, right? Uh, so the next place that we want to take a look at is in the header tag. The header tag, for those of you who know HTML, is usually the H1 through H6 tags, although usually it's H1 through H3 are the most important ones. And it tends to be visually the biggest, boldest text on the page. And here we have New England Infusion Therapy Services. So we've also got some qualifying keywords in there in terms of New England, uh, and then Infusion Therapy Services again. And then uh, in some subheaders, we've got Infusion Therapy, and in the body copy, again, we're we're talking about home infusion therapy, so a lot of related search terms kind of casting the net a little bit wider. One important thing to keep in mind is this still has to read well. You can't have uh, just cramming your keywords in there. Search engines are getting a lot more savvy about keyword cramming, and the bottom line is, at the end of the day, even if you rank well, but people come to your page and it reads poorly because you've crammed the same keyword in over and over again, they're not going to buy from you because you're not going to have any credibility. So the bottom line is you're always writing for humans. You're just trying to make sure that you get the keywords in there so that the search engines will drive traffic your way. Also, if you've got any images on the page, you can't see this, but you want to use what are called alt tags. And in your alt tags, you can also use uh, words like infusion therapy services. And then uh, your meta description as well, which on the back end of, say, WordPress, you there's a place where you can enter in a meta description, which is often the one to two sentence description that appears under the big blue link. You can see here that the big blue link is identical to the page title. That's usually where it comes from. Uh, also, we can see that the URL for this page is Infusion Therapy Services, so they got that in there. And then we're using it in the description as well. Now, that's a lot of what you can do on page. Let's talk about off page, which is also about inbound links. No, obviously not these kind of links. Um, more like the links from other websites and blogs. And there's no perfect uh, number. Like people are always like, well, how many inbound links should I have if they do improve my search engine visibility? And they do. Inbound links help with your domain authority and they drive more traffic to your website. They're very beneficial. And so you want to get more. And so one of the first questions I hear is, well, how many do I currently have? And so there's a tool out there called Moz, and Moz actually has a lot of tools, and one of them is Open Site Explorer, which you can see here. In Open Site Explorer, you can put in your domain name and get some results on inbound links to you. So here we go. Uh, here is our domain authority. Now, actually, our domain authority, I happen to check yesterday was when I was finishing up these slides is lower now although I didn't grab a screen capture and I think a lot of times you'll see that your your uh, domain authority has gone down over time just because of competition uh, sometimes it goes up sometimes it goes down I did see it take uh, a hit at at 
by looking at it more recently. So that tells me that I may need to get more inbound links and build up my credibility a little bit more than I have in the past. It's just getting more competitive out there. But a few things that you should notice on this report. And by the way, this report is free, but if you're using the free version, it limits the data you get. So you'll only see a few of your inbound links. They'll tell you the total number, but you won't be able to see them. So here we see uh, the domain authority, the page authority, that gives us some good information. It tells us how many inbound links they've discovered in the last two months. It also tells us the number of links we've got inbound as well as the number of root domains we have inbound, and those are critical pieces of information. And then if we look in the inbound links, it will tell us some of the most popular pages that are currently linking to us and what the page authority and the domain authority are and if there's a spam and what the spam score is. Anything in the green is good, but if a page seems spammy and untrustworthy, that can actually hurt you if you've got an inbound link from that page. I would say that, although it differs from industry to industry, if you have less than 50 inbound links, I would spend some time getting more inbound links because I think that's going to pay off for you nicely. If you've got more than 50 links and your search engine visibility still isn't good, I might focus my attention instead on on-page results. Uh, to go out and find links, um, there's a few things uh, I might recommend. One of the best options to getting inbound links, links from other websites to yours, are, are doing guest blog posts. And there's a few different ways to go about this. Probably the simplest would be is do a Google search on guest blog or guest post plus your industry. So if you're a dog trainer, guest blogs plus dog trainers. And you'll find a number of dog training blogs out there that are actively looking for, uh, for guest bloggers and you can create some content for them and as payment what you'll do is you'll get a link back to your website and this is really relevant because if you're getting a lot of inbound links from guest blogging or from for any reason but in this case from guest blogging from related websites that's very beneficial you also may want to check and see what the what the uh, domain and the page authority are using that same tool at Moz we just looked at for some of these guest blogging opportunities. If the site doesn't have any trust built up or if it comes across as being spammy, then you probably don't want to guest blog for them. But if you do get, uh, if you do find a site that's looking for guest blogs and they have some really good numbers there, then that's a great opportunity for you to create content. And if you're already blogging, you can do what my friend Andy Crestedina calls the evil twin blog post, where if you've got uh, five things to remember on your college application, you can then write the, the evil twin one, which would be something like uh, five mistakes people make on their college applications. It's the same content just through a different lens. Uh, so you can do that and get that content out there and then those will link back to your website. Also, if you have any paid memberships as a business organization, a lot of times, if not always, they'll have a website and they'll link to you, so just make sure that you have that link going to your website. Uh, and there are link building companies out there that will create, that go out and they'll ask for links and they'll get links into you. My issue with that is, A, it's mind-numbingly mind -numbingly dull to do it yourself, but at the same time, there's a lot of questionable companies out there who do link building. So if you are going to hire somebody to do links, build links for you, they should be very transparent and they should be able to give you lots of recommendations of people they've helped. Like, this is something that can go terribly pear-shaped if you hire the wrong company, so just be careful. And I want to mention a few technical things as well that you need to keep in mind as you are trying to improve your search engine visibility, things that could get in your way and hurt you. One is your website needs to be mobile friendly. There's no two ways about it. It should be for a million different reasons, but it does help your search engine visibility. More and more searches are being done on mobile devices such as smartphones or tablets. And Google is penalizing sites that are not mobile friendly in those type of searches. So if you are on a website that doesn't work on a mobile device or doesn't look good on a mobile device, you're really shooting yourself in the foot. So make sure that your website is mobile friendly. If it's not, that's probably the number one thing you need to do. Speedy. Your website needs to be speedy. Now it should be speedy for a number of different reasons, especially for user experience, but it also should be speedy because page load time is a search engine ranking factor according to Google. So if you've got two pages that are of equal value and equal content, and one of them loads significantly faster than the other, it's going to rank higher. 
It's as simple as that. You can go into your Google Analytics, and in your Google Analytics, they actually have a speed test. And you can look at your pages and get a sense of whether or not they're loading faster or slower than normal. And Google will even tell you some specific things that you can do to speed up slower pages. I say this with a caveat because I've sat down with my team when I've seen a page that happens to load a little bit slower, and sometimes the recommendations that they make just don't make any sense or the payoff is so small it's not worth it and some of our most popular pages happen to be very slow loading because they're 3,000 word blog posts with lots of images because we need to explain something so always do what you can to speed up a page it's not the only thing that's important but all things being equal you do want faster loading pages and finally security is becoming a bigger and bigger issue when it comes to uh, search engine optimization and search engine rankings. Two pages, again, that are of equal content. If one of them is on an HTTPS website and the other one is on a typical HTTP website, the secure site's going to get the edge. So for our clients who are looking to improve their search engine visibility, one of the things that we do now is we make sure that we get them an SSL security certificate and that helps. You don't need to get a very expensive one. They range in prices and you just need one so you can get the HTTPS but that is going to make a difference in your search engine rankings. So that kind of takes care of the on-page, off-page, and technical issues of what's called organic search. But if you've done a search recently, you've probably seen something like this. So you're searching for a local, uh, for a dance studio, and Google knows that chances are you're looking for a dance studio near you. So there's a very good chance that they're going to show you three local results. It's always a three-pack of local results and then you can see the more places. But the bottom line is, if I see good results in those top three local search results, I'm probably not going to go to more places. And as you can see, I'm actually, these results are above the organic results, pushing the organic results down. So if you do a search for, for yourself, maybe not by brand name, but by category or something like that, and you see some local search results come up, then you know you need to get yourself into the local search uh, results into that three pack. Now there are a lot of variables when it comes to ranking in that three pack. And you can see uh, this is a screen capture I took from moz.com and the URL is down below if you want to dig a little bit deeper, local search ranking factors. Um, but there's two categories here. One is that local pack which we just looked at and the other one is just organic search results that happen to be more locally focused. And there's a number of different factors that weigh in here. One of the most important being, you know, just getting into Google My Business and a number of other on-page signals and getting reviews. And this is something that you definitely want to take a look at if you serve a local populace or if you serve tourists as well. And although SEO is not really about paid search. I just want to point out here that if you want to rank well at the search engines, if you want to have search engine visibility, uh, you may need to consider paid search. Here's a search I did on home inspection, and as you can see, I've got two ads up at the top, and to be honest, you can have up to four ads now showing at the top, and then the local search results, and then the uh, and then the search organic results below that, which may not even appear until I scroll down the page, especially if I'm on a smartphone. So if you do a search for your keywords that you're targeting and you see local results and you see paid ads, if you want to get traffic, you are going to have to spend money on ads. There's no two ways about it. Paid search is outside of today's topic, but I did want to bring that up. And lastly, although we're running short on time, I just want to say that you absolutely need to be measuring results. Now, obviously, the most critical result is to generate more leads from your website, but there are some things that you want to take a look at anyways, and the number one tool you're going to use is Google Analytics. That's going to give you a sense of what kind of traffic uh, you're getting from the search engines and also what kind of keywords you're getting as well. So here, even though most of them are still hidden from, from the search results, I can start to see on the left-hand term uh, column what search query is driving traffic to my site, how many clicks I got, how many impressions I got, or in other words, the number of time one of the pages on my website showed up for a result, whether or not it was clicked in the search results, what the click-through rate was on that page, and what my average position was on that page as well. 
And you can dig a little bit deeper. I mentioned Moz before, and uh, Moz is one of many tools out there, but it's one that we happen to use here at Flight. And you can actually, this is a paid, um, paid report, but I can compare my search visibility and compare it to a number of other local competitors, which is what we did here, blurred them out, so protecting them. Uh, but you can see your search visibility uh, and number of visits and domain authority going up, going down, and there's more reports as well. So if you're really interested in tracking how certain keywords are doing, because that's another thing I can do is Am I going up or down for specific keywords? Those are results that I can get in Moz. That's very helpful as well. Uh, this might be something that's worth taking a deeper look at and investing for your own company. So again, SEO, critical piece of the bare essentials of digital marketing, which is to build, attract, retain, and evaluate. And that brings us to the 30-minute mark. I want to thank everybody for their time. If you missed anything, this has been recorded. We will share the video with you. We'll also split out the audio and the slides as well so you can digest it however you see fit. Uh, if you need to go now, totally understand. But if you want to stick around and ask some questions about SEO or any digital marketing questions, I'm going to stick on the line for a little while, so I'd be happy to take any of your questions. Just put them into that questions box, and I'll kind of go in order. So the first question is, do I have any experience with the WordPress plugin by Yoast? Yes, actually, this is, so again, this would just be for WordPress, and the company is called Yoast, and they make a number of plugins that are on the freemium platform. In other words, they're free to start, but they unlock some additional tools if you do the paid version. And yes, we love Yoast here at Flight. We use it on all of our websites and all of our client websites as well. Yoast is a tool that basically for every single page and every single blog post, you can mess around with the title, you can mess around with the meta description. If you tell it what keyword you're targeting, it will tell you um, how well you're doing and what some opportunities are. They'll give you kind of a red, yellow, and green lights next to things you're doing poorly that might be worth taking a look at or you're doing really well so it can generate a score for you. It does a lot more than that too. It also does things like it tells about the readability of a given page and it can even help you with some of your social sharing. So I'm a big fan of Yoast. It's basically spelled toast with a Y instead of that first T and uh, definitely if you're on WordPress something you should check out. Uh, a lot of people saying thank you and great job. Certainly appreciate that. And another question, do links from social media sites count towards inbound links? Most of the links that you're going to get from Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn are what are called no follow links or they're just completely discounted. So from my understanding, there's no direct benefit from inbound links when it comes to SEO, but there's certainly an indirect. The bottom line is if your links are out there on social media sites and you find other people who are following the links to your page, there's a very good chance that they may share it on a blog, which then would have some value to it, or they link to it some other way. Uh, those sort of signs do make a difference. Google says that they take a look at some social media sites and social media activity in terms of trustworthiness, I would say it's a low item, um, but certainly getting links from social media sites helps. I just don't think it's a number one driver of search engine rankings. Uh, somebody asks, I'm using Wix. Any reference to assisting SEO for these type of sites? I've tried to go through their SEO assist, but I feel like I possibly could do more. Um, I'm not super familiar with Wix because it is one of those platforms that's specifically about, you know, building a website quickly and easily and cheaply for yourself rather than the kind of work we would do. So I don't get a lot of hands on with Wix. I do know that they offer SEO services and SEO tools. Uh, if I was on Wix and decided I wanted to stay on Wix, I certainly would familiarize myself with that and I would put my focus on still doing the keyword research, which you absolutely can do, and making sure I'm using my keywords and my titles and my headers and my body copy. And, and one thing I think I forgot to say is also in the links from one page to another. So making sure that you are not using words like click here or learn more, but instead using keyword rich uh, links from one page to the next. Those are all things you should be able to do through Wix. And then the other thing you could do if you're uh, stuck on Wix would be is to focus on some inbound links as well. 
So thinking about things like what are my guest blogging opportunities, another one I didn't mention in the in the webinar would be podcasts. Uh, podcasts are great because, you know, writing a blog post, writing a good blog post, I don't know about you, it takes me like three or four hours, maybe longer. I've got one blog post I'm working on. Admittedly, I'm not working on it steadily, and it's going to be probably over 4,000 words when I'm done with it, but it's taken me months and probably close to eight hours. Uh, that's obviously on the extreme, but compare that to you get on a podcast, they interview you for 20 or 30 minutes, and you're just talking, and you still get that link from that other website over to yours. So guest podcast opportunity is another great way to get some inbound links as, as well. And obviously, it's unrelated to whether you're on Wix or whether you are on WordPress. And so a follow-up question, should you, would I advise another platform or WordPress instead for SEO optimization? I absolutely would. Um, my feeling with sites like Wix and even Squarespace Yes, they're great. They serve a purpose. A lot of people are being successful in them. I'm not saying you can't be. I'm obviously biased because I run an agency that builds WordPress websites and I love WordPress. Um, but all things being equal, I like to have more control. And I find that I have more control using a tool like WordPress than I would on Wix. Because <clears throat> Wix wants to make things easier and simpler for you. And to do that, it sometimes has to add training wheels, so to speak, on your website so that you don't break it, but just by doing that, it also kind of handcuffs you as well. So could I share the WordPress plugins that I feel are standard on the websites that Flight does? Uh, we do different ones for different people, but we always use, and of course I'm not a developer, so I might get this wrong, but I'm pretty sure. Uh, just looking at my own, we, you know, I love um, Yoast as we mentioned, uh, Word Fence, which is a security plugin, is I believe on every website that we put out there. Um, another one that I use religiously is called Pretty Link. And that's just one. So I'm sure you've all seen Bitly links. If I want to promote something and I've got a long URL, or if I want to hide a tracking code on a URL, then I might just use Pretty Link to do something like takeflight.com slash SEO. If I want to do, you know, drive traffic to, to this, uh, I think takeflight.com slash 30 SEO was the um, pretty link that I used for this. It was a much longer URL with a tracking code in there, but I didn't want to, excuse me, I wanted to use something that was looked better in social media when people would see that link. So that's one that we use. I use a lot of lead pages, the company lead pages, and they have a plugin for both their lead pages and lead boxes. So that's another one that I really like. Uh, I'm sure there are more. I just can't think of any others that we regularly use off the top of my head for, for all the different ones. If I do, I'll, I'll share those later. Uh, Rich, what do you see the focus should be when you are doing local SEO? So one of the things that I tell people with local SEO is you want your NAP information to be consistent. NAP stands for name, address, and phone number. So whatever you choose for name, address, and phone number on your website, you want to be consistent with that. I know I keep going back to Moz, but they do have all these great tools. They do have a freemium tool for local SEO. And the first thing you can do is just see how you're doing with local SEO. So you plug in your company name, you plug in your, uh, what's it called? Your zip code. And they'll give you a report card. They'll take a look at all the important directories out there and tell you if your information is consistent, if it's inconsistent, if it's duplicated, all this other stuff. That's something we work with a lot of clients on. We do a whole, what we call a cleanse and claim, where we get, or claim and cleanse, sorry, I got that backwards. First thing you want to do is you want to prove that you're the owner of the company. And secondly, once you've proven ownership, there's a lot more you can do. So the NAP information uh, in and also your... Um, Google My Business. That's another critical piece as well. Those are two things that just, that's the least amount you can do, but those are two really strong things you can do. Then it's about getting reviews. Then it's about, you know, some other things you can do on your website. But that's that's where you should begin. Uh, Rich, other than the basics, what is must-have info in the Google My Business, um, which you set up because of one of my podcasts? Thanks. Um, you know, one of the things that they've just added to Google My Business that we've been playing around with lately is Google Posts that are great for promoting different events that you might be going on and or might be hosting. <clears throat> so that'll add some extra visibility for sure. And then it's not so much in the Google My... Well, it kind of is. So if a client says to you, uh, hey, I really liked working with you. 
um, or they say something really nice about an employee or whatever the case is, you might say, thank you very much. By the way, would you mind leaving that recommendation on Google? If you do a search for uh, my company on Google, you know, Company X on Google, you'll see us in the right-hand column, a little uh, knowledge box about our company, and there's a place you could leave a review. Would you leave a review for us? Having people leave reviews is definitely one of the signals that Google looks for in terms of local SEO. So that's definitely something else that I would take a look at as well. How many keywords per page should you use? What about long tails? All right, so I don't know that there's an exact number of keywords per page, but Google loves a narrow focus. So I wouldn't try, you know, I might come up with one primary keyword phrase and target that on a page or a blog post. And then if there are related phrases, I'd work them in, but I would definitely have a focus of one keyword as the topic for a given page. And if I wanted to target a second keyword that was different enough, I'd probably write a second blog post about that. So if I was writing one and I email subscription rates, I would write one that was focused entirely on that. And if I also wanted to you know, target the phrase building your email list, which is obviously related, I would probably make that the focus of a second blog post and then make sure that I linked the two blog posts together with uh, in intrasite links. And about long tails, for those of you who don't know, a long tail search is just a search that is much more detailed uh, with many more words in it. You're not going to get a lot of people searching for that, but if they're searching for that exact phrase and you've got it, then chances are you're going to get that business. And there's a lot more traffic that comes in on the long trail than on the short trail, uh, short tail searches. So, you know, Travel might get a lot more searches, but you know you may want to target the long tail, especially if you're a small business and you're going up against the Goliaths in the industry. You may want to target some of this long tail search traffic. And if you're targeting something that's like adventure travel in Belize for the whole family, you're still going to get in some of your keyword phrases that are a little bit short, shorter tail, like Belize travel or some or just travel in general. Do links from constant contact emails count towards that inbound link tally? They do not. Um, you could mean one of two things in this. Literally, links and emails that are out there, no, they don't count. And then the other thing is, a lot of times, um, constant contact and probably other email service providers as well, provide some sort of service where they will create a web page for your email so that you can drive traffic from social to that page. I never use that service. I would rather create a blog post and then create an email that doesn't have the whole blog post in there, but kind of teases the topic. So I get people from their inbox over to my post, and then I can drive SEO value to that, but they're not gonna come, that SEO value is not gonna come from the, um, from the email link. And I also don't wanna take my best content, put it up on Constant Contact either. So I'd rather have that content on my own website. Which words would you use instead of click here or learn more? Whichever ones make sense. So if you go take a look at the uh, Flight New Media, actually, why don't we take a look at the Flight New Media website, Rich? Um, I'll just pull this up right now. You should be able to see my screen. And I'll go take flight.com and I will meditate later. And as we look down to my content area, you'll see like instead of like, Digital Marketing Action Plan, Rank Higher, Social Media, Leads and Customers, Contact Us Today. Those are all things that I could have written originally as click here, learn more, but instead I'm using keyword phrases, keyword rich phrases. So if somebody's searching on Rank Higher, then Google knows that that's one of the phrases that might be about for people who are looking how to optimize their website for, for the search engines. So obviously, you should be using the keywords that are relevant for you. What about the influence of YouTube videos on SEO? There isn't really a lot, but SEO is, uh, or YouTube is amazing for search engine visibility in general. So I'd strongly recommend um, creating videos and posting them to YouTube. There's a whole different methodology to ranking videos high in on YouTube. And I've got a podcast with Brian. Well, my, so my podcast is the agents of change. There's an episode with Brian Dean. I did. I interviewed him twice. There's one about if you Google, let's try this. 
YouTube SEO Brian Dean Agents of Change. Talk about your long tail, right? Here's this uh, this podcast that I did. So you can see that um, this is a detailed, if you really want to learn more about YouTube SEO, this would be a great interview to take a look at. Brian Dean is just brilliant when it comes to this sort of stuff, has done a lot of research, well worth checking out. Do trade show online directories that have your website add to the inbound link count? Yes, as long as they're not no follow tags. If you want to take a look at the source code, you can find out if they're no follow tags because it will say no follow in the link. Uh, if they don't do that, yeah, absolutely. That's definitely an inbound link for you. Uh, will I be doing a webinar specifically about search engine marketing, also known as paid search, in the future? Yes, but I am not that guy. So um, what I would recommend in the meantime is we have a number. It, go to the Agents of Change website, search for paid search or PPC. I've done a number of interviews with people much smarter than me in that category. Um, I might, we'll definitely do something and we do stuff on paid search. It's just not my area of expertise, but I'll definitely keep that in mind. Uh, we've got uh, a guy in our office. John, who does all of our paid search for our, ourselves and our clients, might tag him to do something upcoming on paid search as well, because I do think it's so critical for small businesses these days to wisely invest in paid search. Rebrandly, somebody's offering, Rebrandly is also great for link shortening. Uh, what are your thoughts on landing pages and squeeze pages? Do they count towards the SEO value of a website? They can, but to be honest, they're a different animal entirely. And if I'm doing a landing page or a squeeze page, it's not for SEO. It's because I've got an, uh, a social media campaign or some other kind of campaign where I'm driving traffic and I don't want to bother people with navigation. I want to make it as simple as possible. So to me, that feels like something that is really not even kissing cousins with SEO. Is it unusual for my Google Analytics data site visits to differ from the Google Analytics data I see on site visits in back end of my WordPress site? Um, so if I'm understanding you correctly, you've got some sort of Google Analytics plugin on WordPress and you're getting another, and you've also got Google Analytics set up remotely and you're checking and the numbers aren't the same. There could be a million different reasons for this. The one that pops into my head, uh, first outside of the, it's configured incorrectly is maybe when you're logging into one or both of these accounts that they've got different filters set up so you're getting slight or different views one might be looking at one view one might be looking at another view that's definitely an in-depth topic we are going to do google analytics at some point we've actually got a master class if you're in the greater portland area we've got a master class coming up on google analytics check out the take flight website i think we only have one seat left uh, so if you are interested that is a paid uh course with me and limited to six people where we go a real deep dive into your Google Analytics. Um, so that might be uh, better for that. But I will at some point in the future be doing a Google Analytics 30 minute webinar as well. Are .gov links more valuable than .com links or does a higher DAPA prevail? Great question. Uh, .gov links have a lot of value because government sites don't often link out or don't link out as often as a .com. They're more difficult to uh, mess around with, difficult to hack per se or spam. So I would say that it's not necessarily that .gov sites would outrank .com sites just because they're .gov sites, but because they're .gov sites, they're probably going to outrank them if that makes any sense. So yeah, getting .gov and .edu sites, those usually have more value. Um, I don't know how that rank, how that compares necessarily to a good domain or page authority ranking, but if you have uh, oh, audio in, out, back, okay. Um, our .gov, so yeah, I would say if you can get .gov or .edu links, those are great to have as well. All right, it looks like we have reached the end of our questions, which is great because my throat is dry. Uh, as I mentioned before, we will recap this. I will send you a link so you can uh, share this video if you want to. Really appreciate, appreciate you guys for tuning in. We'll be announcing a new webinar uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, and that's going to be on Facebook advertising, and that's going to be led by Amanda, so you can hear her mellifluous voice rather than mine. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And if you have any questions you didn't ask, feel free to send me an email, and I'd be happy to try and get you an answer. Take care now.